Today's lecture provides an introduction to CEDAW, the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. Here's an overview of what we'll discuss today. I'll summarize some basic facts about the convention. We'll analyze the definition of discrimination against women in CEDAW in some depth, and then we'll review the rights and obligations in CEDAW. And we'll focus as well on how CEDAW responds to the public-private distinction critique that we discussed in the previous lecture. First, some basic facts about CEDAW. The convention was open for signature in 1979. It entered into force two years later, and as of January 1st of 2014, 187 states were party to the convention. That leaves only seven UN member nations as not being parties to CEDAW, and you see them listed on the slide before you. The core objective of CEDAW is to prohibit discrimination against women in the enjoyment of human rights and fundamental freedoms. This, of course, raises the question of how CEDAW defines discrimination against women. And that definition appears in the very first article of the convention, Article 1, and you see it before you. And I want to stress a number of things about this definition because it's quite an expansive one, and it is the linchpin for all of the obligations that the convention contains. The convention defines discrimination against women as any distinction, exclusion, or restriction made on the basis of sex, which has the effect or purpose of nullifying the recognition, enjoyment, or exercise by women of their human rights and fundamental freedoms in a range of fields, including in particular political, economic, social, cultural, and civil. That's an exceptionally broad definition. It covers both uh, distinctions or exclusions that are uh, intentional in their discrimination against women or girls, but also distinctions, exclusions, or restrictions that have the effect of discriminating against women and girls in the exercise of their rights. So this phrase, discrimination against women, appears throughout the convention. Before turning to the scope of the convention in terms of the human rights that it protects, I want to raise one issue about this definition, and I'll raise it in the form of a question. Does the de definition of discrimination against women in CEDAW prohibit laws or policies that give a preference to women and girls over men and boys? And the answer in the convention appears in Article 4. And the answer is no, provided that such laws and policies are limited in time and seek to accelerate gender equality. These are what is known in international human rights law as temporary special measures. Uh, in the United States, they'd be referred to as affirmative action. But the specific goal of these measures is not to uh, instantiate or, or put in place permanently in the law some sort of unequal or separate standards, but rather to enhance and speed up gender equality. Now, these measures uh, are only temporary since they should be discontinued once those objectives have actually been achieved. So favoring women and girls, and this might be considered controversial in some countries, would not be considered discrimination against women. Let's move on now to the human rights that CEDAW actually protects. What are the rights uh, that are, it encompasses? Well, we've looked at civil and political rights, and those are certainly covered in CEDAW, rights relating to equality uh, in political and public life, in legal proceedings and documents, but it also covers equality in the context of marriage and family life, so that's in the private sphere, as well as economic and social rights, including education, employment, and health, that we will discuss in greater detail in the coming lectures this week. So it's a broad convention that cuts across different categories of human rights. This then raises the next logical question, which is which kind of laws, policies, and practices discriminate against women and therefore are in violation of the convention? And the answer is that states parties to CEDAW, which as we pre previously noted includes nearly all of the member states of the United Nations, must 
take measures to eliminate discriminatory laws, policies, and practices in three different spheres. In the public sphere, so that's uh, the participation of women in politics, in national laws and constitutions and government policies. In the private sphere, so that's by private individuals, businesses, associations, and groups, and also within uh, the family. And in the cultural sphere, dealing with entrenched prejudices, stereotypes, customary practices, and beliefs. So as you can see, not only is the definition of discrimination against women in CETA very broad, but the scope of the convention, that is to say, the areas in which its state's parties must take action, is also extremely broad. Let's discuss an example of each of these spheres. So uh, under Article 2 of the convention, discrimination in the public sphere uh, is codified in language that requires states to pursue a policy of eradicating discrimination against women. They need to do that by adopting gender equality clauses in their constitutions and by enacting legislation or laws that include sanctions where appropriate to prevent discrimination by public institutions, by government authorities, and by public officials. So this is uh, an obligation that runs directly to the state and its agencies and officials to pursue a policy of non-discrimination uh, on the basis of sex or gender. Now, some examples of discrimination in the private sphere. Uh, here again, the obligation runs to the state's parties who agree to take these particular measures, but the measures are to eliminate discrimin against, discrimination against women by, as you can see from Article 2E, any person, organization, or enterprise, that would include uh, private uh, persons, organizations, or enterprises, or businesses, as well as in all matters relating to marriage, marriage and family relations. Again, uh, a private uh, sphere issue. And again, I would invite you to think back to the previous lecture when we talked about the public-private divide here you see CEDAW responding, at least in part, to that public-private divide or distinction by extending the reach of the obligations into the private sphere. Now, let's talk about the third sphere that CEDAW encompasses, and that's the cultural sphere. And the key article here is Article 5A, which requires states parties to modify the cultural patterns of conduct uh, that are discriminatory against women with a view to achieving or with the goal of achieving the elimination of prejudices and customary and all other practices based on the idea of the inferiority or superiority of either sex or in the stereotype roles for men and women. Now, I'll pause here to note that discrimination in the cultural sphere can be quite deeply embedded and quite pervasive. And so this obligation in CEDAW, Article 5a, is quite an expansive obligation, especially when you pair it with the definition of discrimination against women in Article 1 that we saw earlier. And to foreshadow a discussion that we'll have in the next lecture, you can imagine that states' parties ratifying the convention might have some uh, issues or concerns about what sorts of measures they might take to eliminate discrimination in the cultural sphere. So we'll discuss that in more detail uh, in the next lecture. For now, I will leave you with some additional sources and recent events that you can uh, click on to find more information about CEDAW and discrimination against women.